My folks bought this farm in 1925. I was two years old when they moved here, so that's all I can remember is, is being here. The house had no conveniences at all. No water, no septic tank, no uh, electricity, telephone, uh, no heat. The whole context of life was different then because there was no television, some radio, of course. Uh, we didn't get a d daily paper. Uh, we pretty much made do with what we had here, and, and that was fine. We enjoyed ourselves. We, uh, we worked. Matter of fact, that's how I got my, developed my interest in birds. Now here, I've chickadee off to my right. My brother was interested in, in trees, so my dad encouraged him by saying, okay, every day after lunch, you can take an hour off and study trees. Well, I couldn't see my brother getting, <laughs> getting away with getting off with an hour of work after lunch, so I said, well, I want to study something too. <laughs> well, what do you want to study? And uh, I said, well, birds. <laughs> Peg Tuckamuni was uh, the last of the Lenape Indians in this local area. Uh, she was a weaver of baskets and she lived off the land to a great extent. We understand that she lived uh, at times uh, in the little stone house that is being excavated for an archaeological dig at this point that's right near our house. So it, it seemed logical to my folks to name the farm Tuckamuni after Peg Tuckamuni. Dad grew up on a farm in the Midwest, and when he came here and bought this farm, uh, he was looking for some way to keep this farm productive, and a county agent suggested he grow Christmas trees. My well, dad first uh, planted Christmas trees in 1929. Uh, they didn't go into the field because they were too small. He just got small seedlings. He lined them out in the garden. Then when I came back and, and to the farm after being away to college and so forth, I planted a few more acres to the point that now I have about uh, 17 acres in trees. That's a white spruce. Nice tree. There are times when it's real hot and buggy that uh, it makes it difficult, but knowing that these trees are going to end up in somebody's living room all decorated and, and looking nice, it's, uh, it's a great satisfaction, keeps me going. Besides the Christmas trees, there's also the holly here that my dad planted back in the early 50s. Dad had a passion for holly. And he uh, had at one point some 75 or 80 varieties of holly he was uh, propagating. In this orchard here are probably uh, maybe 150 or 175 trees. In the 20s and increasingly in the 30s, and even more so in the 40s, uh, agriculture became mechanized. Before that, farming had been carried out pretty much as it had been since the pioneers first came here with horse and plow. They could do many more acres and much more land was plowed. And that's when we started to have accelerated erosion. And uh, that's when we had the Dust Bowl in the, in the early 30s out in the, in the Midwest. About 1938-39 is when um, a farmer right downstream here, Alston Waring, who had chickens and a general farm, uh, was uh, observing that he was getting a lot of flooding on his land. And so he went to this soil erosion service office, which was in Philadelphia at the time, and asked, what can I do? Uh, they came out and looked. And they said, well, Mr. Waring, uh, your problem is uh, a watershed problem. And he says, what's that? Uh, well, a, a watershed is the drainage area that drains into the stream here that's flooding and carrying silt. And in order to solve your problem, uh, you need to work with your neighbors upstream and see if they would uh, control the water as it lands on their soil and their fields uh, with uh, erosion control methods. So Alston Waring talked to my dad and, and uh, talked to the other uh, four or five farmers in the watershed, and they agreed to, uh, to work with uh, Alston Waring and the Soil Erosion Service. This project uh, started in 1939 and progressed over the next few years because it takes time to convert uh, square fields to contoured strip cropping fields. It takes time to 
install the terraces to, to hold the water on steep slopes. And the landowners here, the farmers here, uh, were interested in, in not only in conserving the water and the soil, but uh, the wildlife and the forest land. Uh, they included uh, practices that would uh, encourage wildlife, that would uh, provide them food and cover, as well as uh, forest management practices. It became a total conservation program in the watershed. We didn't know then, but we learned since then, this was the first time in the whole country, in the whole United States, that farmers had cooperated on a watershed basis to carry out a conservation plan. In the late 60s, Alston Waring and my dad, Forrest Crooks, became concerned with the amount of urbanization that was pressing in on us. And uh, most specifically, we became aware of the fact that uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation wanted to build a, a four-lane parkway right through the middle of the watershed. And the Philadelphia Electric Company, now called PICO, uh, would run a 500 kilovolt high power line parallel to that uh, parkway, but it would be 500 feet wide and every um, 80 feet or so of length it would consume about an acre of land. That's just gobbling up an awful lot of land. So my dad and Austin uh, talked with the neighbors and, and uh, what came out of it was the plan to go down to Washington and Austin and I went down to Washington to talk to the Secretary of Agriculture. Our discussions with that gentleman uh, resulted in our applying to uh, first the State uh, Historic and Museum Commission for a historic designation because that's why we wanted to save it because it was uh, the very first watershed uh, conservation area, conservation practices carried out by the farmers themselves in the whole country. A real landmark in conservation history in the country. Uh, the result of all this was that, uh, yes, we were established as a National Historic Site, uh, and further than that, we were singled out as a National Historic Landmark. As a result of this uh, landmark designation, federal money could not be spent to destroy this historic landmark. So uh, the whole highway coming through the watershed was dropped immediately. But then that did not take care of uh, the power line. The power line uh, was going to come through anyway. It does get into the watershed a little bit, but only on the uh, eastern portion and uh, does not come through the center of it, so they really didn't invade the watershed. At uh, the dedication of this his National Historic Landmark uh, in October 1968, it was a beautiful day and we had uh, marvelous attendance of, of neighbors and friends and, and government officials. Another uh, key speaker at this dedication was Congressman Pete Beaster, who, um, who really spoke from his heart. Then I remember so clearly, he said, uh, you see here a, a watershed which is not pristine, which is not natural as it was back 200 years ago. It's a watershed, however, where uh, conservation practices have been carried out by the farmers here and they have found a way to live in harmony with nature uh, and still have their farming uh, enterprise. One of the uh, important advisors of this Watershed Association was the director uh, of the National Park Service here in the Northeast region. Uh, he became very much interested in our project and one day right here at the pond we were having a board meeting and he said, why don't you uh, have as, uh, as a central focus of your watershed association, uh, environmental or conservation education? Well, this struck a real bell in the heart of, of, of those of us who were on the board at that time. And uh, so we developed an informal environmental education program here. The environmental education program uh, started off slowly because we were dealing with volunteers only. Uh, but we were fortunate in having uh, one of our supporters, the newly created Bucks County Audubon Society. Had a difficult time raising money, but we still did it. We were dedicated to it. Eventually, 
uh, it just had to expand. We went on a big fundraising program of raising $8,000, and uh, it's just been growing ever since. In the uh, mid to late 60s, I guess, my dad and mother and, and I started thinking through this matter of what's going to happen to the land eventually. Matter of fact, we discussed this for decades, <laughs> uh, even before the 60s, and uh, decided we wanted to keep it as, as a farm, as, as a one unit and not have development on it. The need for environmental education was becoming more and more evident. Uh, we wanted this to remain in perpetuity, uh, to be able to serve this purpose and to be open and to be farmed. We decided to give the land to the Bucks County Conservancy, uh, but retain a family interest in it until 2050. So we have an oasis in this sea of urbanization at this point, and, and, and it'll continue being an oasis and serve uh, as a great opportunity for people to come and see what natural land is. I'm very optimistic about the future, for the future of the environmental education program here and um, in the country. People in the county, the people in the country are more and more concerned about them and their environment. So I'm optimistic over a, a very long period of time that the Environmental Education Center will be here. It's not just this little one group, it's these nuclei all over, uh, all over the country really, from California to New Jersey, and uh, you just can't wave that away. <laughs> you also are not going to wave away all the people around here, and all the businesses, and all the highways, and all the, the traffic, and all this energy, all these people, they all have needs. And the needs come down basically to the capability of our natural resources to provide us uh, with uh, the kind of life which we want. We have so much to learn about the connections between the natural world and the human world. Well, having lived here for three quarters of a century, <laughs> roughly, I'm delighted that it'll keep on being like this. So it's worked out extremely well for our family because we are able to achieve our dream of having this land uh, stay a farm and stay an environmental education center and not be developed. So we have that assurance that uh, our dreams are going to carry on and on and on and on. Uh, at the same time, the Audubon Society and the community benefit from having this area, in, with all the development around it, having this area stay open and natural and be used as an educational center uh, for they and their children and their grandchildren and so forth on down the line. It's a real good feeling. Oh.